this mic on? <gasps> it is. Hey, hello everyone. We're starting. What's up? Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our 2.30 hybrid performance panel experience uh, as a part of Interrupt. My name is Lucas Bache. I'll be moderating today. I'm an MFA candidate here at Brown. Um, so today you will be encountering a series of artists whose work interrogates both uh, corporeal and virtual realities. We will be seeing three works and then we will have a short informal Q&A session. So first up, we have Drought Spa. Drought Spa is the multimedia project of Oakland-based artists Alex Cruz and Kevin C.K. Lowe. Their performances, videos, and installations combine text, stochastic synthesis, and computer vision, among other modes, to examine subjectivities within networked life. They have performed nationally and abroad, and today they will be showing us a genetic mind sounding rudiment maxilla. So please welcome Drought Spa. A genetic mind sounding rudiment max The machine asserts an expressive nomenclature. Or to human relations. Fossils of song it taught itself, and in doing so, rids the lie of body from the voice, makes itself a god just present enough. Feeling blank, ready to inhale the inputs. Like a camera, or more like a child.
revolutionary aspect of WaveNet in comparison to concatenative and parametric methods of speech processing to directly model an audio signal's raw waveform. It begins with unprocessed digital recordings of human speech, 22,000 samples per second from 109 speakers for 44 hours. Writes Brian House, this data is used to train a convolutional deep neural network an algorithm designed to infer higher order structures from elementary inputs. After learning voice recordings using a novel neural network, WaveNet creates speech autonomously. Although these verbs appeal to a romantic humanism that is perhaps misplaced here. What is the sound? What is the sound of one millisecond of human linguistic evolution? The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770 to 1850. Right, Stefan Meyer. Remarkably, when removed from the circumstances for which it was designed, WaveNet can speak on its own. In lieu of a human to converse with, WaveNet can generate speech-like audio that does not correspond to any known language. Quote, speech-like sounds are accompanied by the irregular clicking of digital teeth and of synthetic lips. We are left to wonder what human mouth might produce such uncanny abjection.
Google Keynote delivered in 2018 featured recordings of veiled machine human interaction. WaveNet, ordering food for purchase, booking a client's appointments. Arguably for the individuals who participated in these Turing tests, artificial intelligence had already been codified within a condition of subservience and presumably a lubricant of capital exchange. WaveNet's radical slippage from utilitarian speech forms reveals a sub-semiotic anarchy. Syntax corruption acts as a cipher for breakdowns across lines of as well as communication. Echopraxia, or the involuntary mirroring of an observed act, has been linked to a variety of psychiatric disorders. In a human minds, one might consider this an evolutionary advantage. Separating this mirroring and memory. In the absence of memory, can agency Subjectification flows both ways as the status of individual is yoked to acts of form state recognition. What if we became a species that had no fingerprints? No teeth, no biological infrastructure that could be used for indexing, tracking, memorizing. If a body is not memorizable, could that be its own memories? Could we in turn register our own deaths?
If digital technology has irrevocably transformed human life to a state beyond recognition, can humans unauthor themselves into that which cannot be recognized? In a poem, upon what register does the poem's artificial eye fall? In deep learning, isn't authorship always a multitude? The oxygen around my head is rabid and filled with orange light. I tell you, it is waiting for your branch that flows because you are a sweet-smelling diamond architecture that does not know why it grows. I do it for the geology, and I do it for the fear of your response. What will be the last human artifact before the synthetic mouth's evacuation? It's becoming an ontic blur, something else entirely, the lag or glitch of a virtual body as it tries to render previous frames into a new position, into a genetic characteristic, a debased economy. Thank you. Thank you, you. you Droughtspaw. 
All right, next up, we will be having Ian Hatcher. Ian Hatcher is a text sound code performance artist based in New York. Ian holds an MFA in literary arts from Brown University, where he has also taught courses in digital language arts and black box poetics. Please welcome Ian Hatcher. Hello. Hello. It is a pleasure to be with you. So nice to see all of you here in person. An elusive quality, a physical sharing of space, an overlap of shared understandings or questionings or questionings of understandings or understandings of questionings also heartwarmingly evident here at Interrupt Festival, a gathering which celebrates the interstitial rupture, rudeness, and career derailingly offensive conceptual gestures, and the moment opening to newness, mindfulness of this Now, in the past, then, the location of the pointer reset. Here, now, again, being here takes me back and gives me again to myself in the present. It is a pleasure. So nice to see all of you here in person. An elusive quality of physical sharing of space, an overlap and shared understanding or questioning or questioning of understandings so heartwarmingly evident here at Interrupt Festival. Thank you for inviting me to participate. Of course, I am not myself a writer. I am a consultant in the field of technology. Thank you for your attention. Your attention has value. Thank you too for understanding the necessity of the non-disclosure agreement you signed outside the auditorium. We trust you understand the need for legally binding mechanisms of trust. In addition to my role as a consultant, I am here as a representative of Alphabet. Alphabet is, as most of you know, the foundational corporate entity which oversees Google and other subsidiaries. Naturally, Alphabet finds these proceedings to be of some interest. Alphabet seeks to contextualize and to absorb your experimental practices with language. For this appearance today, I thought, I would share with you some two, some two details of Alphabet's internal initiatives, which will be of interest to you as language-focused creatives. Shall I share these with you? You may say continue or go on. <laughs> All right. Before I share these projects with you, I thought we might do a little exercise first. A little exercise in listening, speaking, and following instructions. A little icebreaker so that I will be more comfortable and you will be more comfortable. <laughs> Your participation is required. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. All right. 
Repeat after me. 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 Thank you for your participation. I do note with some small disappointment that the level of enthusiasm in your participation <laughs> was not as great as I would like as this exercise requires. I remind you that your participation is required <laughs> and lack of enthusiasm on your part will be noted. <laughs> Let's try this again, shall we? All right. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. All right. Repeat after me. Not no. <laughs> no, that is not correct. No. The first instance of the phrase is the control instruction followed by content to which you will apply the instruction. Do you understand? Yes. All right, let's try this again, shall we? Yes. All right. Repeat after me. No. No, that is not correct. The first instance of the phrase is the instruction, which is then followed by content to which the instruction is applied. Let's try this again, shall we? Yes. All right. Remember, the first instance of the phrase is the instruction, which is then followed by content to which the instruction is applied. All right. Repeat after me. 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 The first project I thought I would share with you today <laughs> is one that strikes at the heart of a fundamental problem of contemporary discourse. As you all agree, information in mutable transmitted media can be unstable, its veracity indeterminate, truth as a concept factuality is being effectively and pervasively undermined by agents with profit motives for systemic destabilization. This is a problem because if we cannot rely on data, what can we rely upon? To engage with this problem, Alphabet has developed a software tool that takes as input language, natural language found in the digitized wild. It applies a filter, an algorithm, to determine basic truth or falsity. This determination is based on semantic analysis, linguistic tagging, discursive contexts, and a modified version of page rank which incorporates credibility score modifiers to boost or diminish the relative weights of various subfactors. This algorithm returns a floating point result for each assertion or subassertion or implication, which is then cast to an easy to understand binary, true or false. 
a Boolean value computed from a natural language string, if you will. A linguistic extension of computational logic as a logical extension of language, as Professor Cayley called for in his talk earlier today. <laughs> I will share some examples. For example, if we take the string, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. This string computes to true. Whereas, if we take the string, I am the least racist person you have ever seen in your life. This string computes to false. Whereas, if we take the string, this sentence is false. This string computes too. Of course, this result could be true or false, depending whether the sentence is parsed as an instruction or as uninstantiated linguistic material. In the algorithm, relative interpretations oscillate between opposing frames of reference. Each one weighted for contextual relevance as performative utterance or inert statement. In this case, in this context, at Interrupt Festival, we can conclusively determine the sentence this sentence is false, is true. Alphabet looks forward to making this new service available as a convenient app for Android devices and within Gmail as a non-optional feature. Alphabet is confident that providing this service to all of its users will enhance their experience and the health of civil societies of course, returned results will also take into account users' browsing histories and other data and will, like Google search results, be personalized. The second project I am excited to make you aware of is one which approaches the problem of efficient extraction of value from personal networks. Acquaintanceships, collegialities, friendships, and romantic entanglements form the power structures that keep the lights on, metaphorically and practically, in any community of individuals who recurrently congregate. It is clear to all of us and to Alphabet that for too long, unreliable chance encounters and poor strategic decisions have undermined the effectiveness and profitability of personal affiliate networks. So, as you are thrilled to learn now, have confidence in confidence, heartwarmingly evident that Alphabet has determined a new tool to algorithmicize and streamline the vector processes that are essential to personal network reinforcement. Let me explain. Alphabet has created a way to generate value-driven digital maps of personal and institutional connections within communities based on data continuously mined from social media, followers and patterns of likes become models of affinities and influence. These models, which incorporate cross-reference search activity, email capta, geolocation, and financial transaction histories, are used to generate multidimensional social rankings for each individual to find the most potentially fruitful modes and nodes of contact, intervention, and cross-pollination. The tool determines for you who among your acquaintances you should reach out to or connect with or reconnect with 
to most efficiently improve your own social position. The tool provides to you assignments of upcoming events to attend. With dossiers and photos of certain people at each event, you will endeavor to meet accidentally and generate conversation with about your mutual interest in the event or your shared acquaintances or your domestic geolocation or geographical origins and establish mutual trust and interest and entrench yourself as a vital and well-connected social node. This tool is not ready yet for beta testing, but when it is, you will be informed if you are determined to be sufficiently prominent and well-connected for your participation to be useful. <clears throat> the third and last project to share with you today is a long-term ambitious alphabet undertaking, an engine for large-scale generation of narrative. Narrative, the temporal path finding of a B to a flower, a traced path through associative probabilities, causes and effects assigned to perceived actors with agency or not within a system. A provisional collapse of wave functions, a narrowed route through an infinite data set with meaning, of course. The contours of narrative, competing or complementary narratives, providing a series of anchors for discourse, for identity, for behaviors. Where is the exit, one wonders, one where there is no sign. When platforms cross it, cross it, cross it, cross, so, sorry, I can't. Threshold from prediction to determination, from modeling to building cultural structures, accepted reality revises itself to accommodate discrepancies. As we automate our linguistic systems, ceasing to perceive them as forces actively shaping our world, simply accepting their design imperatives subconsciously as constants, constraints and affordances as inevitabilities, loops of feedback altering the form and functionality of language and culture. Alphabet. Is of course highly aware of this, for as long as alphabet has been alphabet, Alphabet has observed closely as Facebook's formal systems, so clumsy, so easily manipulated, undergirded with brittle and poorly scoped code, have been exploited for narrative purposes. Facebook's reinforcement of filter bubbles has contributed to the dystopian, humiliating narrative sequence we currently inhabit. Alphabet does not intend to sit idly by as its own platforms are exploited. Alphabet intends to take a proactive approach. Alphabet is in the early stages now of developing a generative narrative engine to create arcs of story, of ideology, of news curation, which will decisively shape our users' lives and behaviors. We have trained an array of neural networks with many years of right-wing media and associated the models with polling data in order to effectively understand the mechanisms of the American ideological filter bubble to replicate it schematically. With trillions of A-B tests run through generative networks, learning from continuous experimentation we are able to craft a system to craft compulsory narratives to shape society toward healthy processes and ends. 
an engine for automated benevolent propaganda. Everything folding into the center. Every interaction with our platforms infused with kindness, nutritional value, environmentalism, and global citizenship. There are, of course, many subtle considerations to be dealt with and addressed in this very large undertaking. Of course, it is the early days, so I should not say much more about it. But I do want to reassure you with the information that Alphabet is working on it. I hope that knowing this grants you a degree of hope. Also, we have openings for consultant writers to advise our engineers on narrative design. If you are interested in working with us, please approach me after this panel. Of course, consulting writers will be compensated commensurately with numeric indicators of the cultural perception and influence of their work. That is all for now. Thank you for listening and for including me in Interrupt Festival. I look forward to working with a subset of you at Alphabet as Alphabet works tirelessly to increase the luminosity of the already bright future of language. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Lastly, we have Samantha Gorman. Samantha Gorman is a writer, artist, curator, and educator. Her work combines text, cinema, games, virtual reality, and scholarship on digital media. She is a co-founder of the studio Tender Claws. She holds an MFA from Brown University in writing for digital media and is a PhD in media arts and practice at USC's School of Cinematic Arts. Please welcome Samantha. Hello, thanks so much for inviting me to interrupt. I'm super excited to be back. It's always really nice to share the stage with Ian. Um, so I also saw something that was really cool was that there's gonna be cave tours. And that is actually some context for some of the work I'm gonna show. Um, I run now a studio, about 12 people. We do kind of language and digital experiments that have found a home in popular culture in this realm of called indie games. And a lot of the kind of interventions we do are either trying to push some of the, the politics of the technology or some of the, um, the ways we can see this, these technology um, innovating before it's further codified by these structures that we work under. So one of the things that I'm going to show you is actually something that hasn't come out yet, but will be coming out very shortly. It was previewed at Sundance about a month ago. And it is called The Under Presents um, at the moment. And it is a larger four-hour narrative of a stage show. It's a long-form VR and theater hybrid, which what we did over the course of the year, um, we were just able to talk about the project, is develop technology so actors can join in anywhere remotely around the world as people from their living rooms are going into these, uh, this theater experience and going into the game experience. Um, so what this practically does is at certain moments you can have live stage shows, but you can also have actors inhabit what you previously thought of as um, recorded NPCs, kind of like puppets, 
and like bring them to life and then address you in a way that plays between, that um, blurs the line between recorded and live. And I'll be showing you a little bit of behind the scenes of the writing process and the process of working with a coder to generate this script. But this is a very brief teaser from the project. Distinguished guests, are you looking for a little entertainment? You've come to the right place. A venue outside of time and space. May I present the under. Cool. So the basic narrative is in two parts. You have this guy who's called the MC. Um, who inhabits this place that's a vaudeville stage that exists in this special dimension. Um, that's sort of like the Bermuda Triangle where it, it uh, gathers up all these lost voyages and souls and they become characters that perform for you. So one of the things that's relevant about this is we actually, when we were here, um, it was about like seven years of In the Cave thinking about how to stage, uh, we did some early performances in theater and how to think about um, performing in virtual environments but also we're partnered with um, some of our friends who went on to, perform, to create this experimental theater troupe called Pie Hole in New York. And we did this project because we had wanted to work with them on this long-term um, endeavor. So a lot of these stage acts you see are real performance artists in New York that were curated, that we worked with to create avatars and kind of um, like virtual representations of themselves performing in the stage where the un where things that weren't real could possible like that weren't possible could actually happen because it's in VR so you have things like floating heads spewing like dandelion seeds and you know among many other um, dancing cats this is Aaron Markey in wet food and there's a wonderful like line dancing cat performance and a very touching uh, song about how Trash Kitty, she got Trash Kitty off the street and wasn't getting along in the family and then it learned to love wet food from the can and now everyone gets along and loves each other. So there's actually a second component to this project which is a story within a story and most of it, the three hours, takes place, it's been called kind of sleep no more in meets journey like in the l larger media most of it takes place on this ship and it's a survival narrative and you're following these about 10 characters over the course of like um the research vessel an ill-fated an ill-fated journey on a research vessel as it gets stranded in the ice and the supplies are um, dwindling and different characters you know meet sort of gruesome and alternately hilarious fates um, and you, you may or may not, as this sort of time sprite, be able to change their fate, be able to kind of influence the story a bit. It's kind of debatable. Um, there is a pattern that records your past self and your past actions, so you can work with yourself to kind of go through some of these um, narrative moments. There's times when you can go into the characters, like a portal opens up and you can go into the character's mind and see their past and kind of work with these live actors that inhabit the characters to flesh out parts of like the narrative. And it's very much like a, um, you have to hunt for these moments and we're hoping a community develops around this that kind of can cue each other into where these, these sections are. Um, this is a GIF actually that shows some of the, this is very early development, some of the time um, mechanics we were playing with and you can see some of the characters moving on down there, so a lot of it is being able to jump in and out of these like time transfer points. So the process behind this is we actually worked a little bit with uh, someone who used to chair named Brian Evanson to create a script that was the, you know, the backbone for some of the horror, the drama that happens. And part of the process of writing with and in these forms is I work with a team of developers so I, as a writer, have to know some certain sort of code and language to be able to communicate with them to create these projects, but they also have to learn some sort of, you know, a narrative structure and writing formatting to create these, you know, collabor the collaborative backbone in these technologies that allow our projects to happen. So this is behind the scenes. This is one of the, our lead devs, 
um, creating this formatting structure based on screenplays that essentially allow writers to create locations for any of these characters at any time, are able to like give exact time code. And if you're trying to piece together 10 different people moving in space in your mind at once while looking at us, it, it's very, it can be, it was a little harrowing. Um, so we created this system, which then transfers into like a uh, actual a coding, a coding environment where the script can be written with different um, kind of, you know, key keywords and different uh, markup language in order to then translate into various visualizations. However, when we're teaching writers how to write within this format, it's something that you know, they also have to learn how to actually validate a script and what it means to validate a script in order to have it to execute and to run um, to, into these visualizations, because it's not just like what's on paper anymore, but it's now become something that you know, can be played, can be experienced in a 3D environment. And one of the visualizations that I'm able to get is I had to like, you know, I went through the script, I did a lot of editing and a lot of piecing things together, is this just this very 2D uh, character movement over time. And this is something that I would look at. The blue dots represent the speaking character. The red is where they exit. Uh, green is where they enter. So I can see kind of a bird's eye view, at least of like the narrative distribution of the project. Um, and then I you know, can also see it by who's in what location at what time doing what at any given moment. So the thing that I was trying to find, which is sort of interesting, if you remember that overview of the ship, this is actually not supposed to be the final visualization. So what we were working towards and what we were able to do is have the script come up and have just sort of um, the ship with all the different characters, like awful Lego people moving around in real time and, and you know, intersecting with each other, just, whoops, sorry, that was okay, it was just a little startling, um, and, and, you know, uh, juxtaposing, and we could see which di lines of dialogue were playing at once, or like, oh, this chef, you know, he just cut off his thumb, you know, and he's bleeding in the kitchen, but at the same time, he's in the engine room, that can't happen. So we were trying to like reconcile those things, not only in the writing, but in the code and in the system at the same time. So there is actually a live component to this where I can show in a second, but there's a whole nother component of like um, each, each 10 characters has an hour of straight mocap. So that's 10 hours of mocap and we're a small team. So to do that, we actually developed this kind of very um, simple, yet uh, portable mocap system in a way to capture live performance. So I'm gonna kind of show you from the last two days uh, some sneak peeks into that. And this is like the timeline. So this is where our script is and this is where it's configuring and, and we're editing it as we go and as we listen to these and capture these recorded, recorded actors. Alexandra. That's uh, our producer. Nice up on the box. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you can see some of the timeline here. And she's doing a lot of this improv. So you're seeing her live improv this character. I'll give her parameters for the scene. Our director will occasionally yell out cues. And we'll, we'll lie this uh, scratch audio. One minute remaining. But that's not how we usually do it. Um, in this scene, you can see it's starting to get into what we pre-recorded and what she's she's um, acting out the gestures on top of. And we're using just a very simple mechanic of certain sensors at different joints. And then we're using mathematically calibrating where the body is based on those points. To be okay. I don't know what to say. Gerald would. Gerald would know exactly what to say. He might have been trying to warn us. Gerald's a dolphin. He's not trying to send us messages. Are you making the dubious scientific claim that dolphins can't communicate? After all this time, you think I don't know when Gerald's trying to tell me I'm something? I'm trying to tell you something. All right, so <laughs> there's a, um, a very tense uh, relationship between a mollusk researcher and his wife, who's a dolphin researcher, and he's jealous of her NSF funding because dolphins are sexier. And like, <laughs> there's a lot of domestic tension that goes on with this like dolphin getting in between their relationship. Um, anyway. So, you know, we're kind of going, as we're going, we're also changing the position of the body to match some of the, the elements of the narrative and the gesture to hit like the exact beats that we want the actors to get at. 
this is something funny that I just wanted to really quickly good. share because uh, we're really proud of kind of the DIY element. So we have this like a uh, character who inhabits both worlds and ties a lot of the narrative together. And we want the characters to kind of situate themselves in the world and make themselves feel more alive by interacting with the set. But we're a very small team and that to do this type of production value takes a lot of resources. So we hooked up this a funny swivel um, stool with a, uh, a like a uh, pressure like um, a, a servo motor. You okay? <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> Try to stay away. So yeah. Um, and then this is one of my favorite outtakes. We learned that you can hook up multiple rigs to one person. <laughs> So I'm going to show you one more thing. And this is actually when we went to Sundance, we showed about 120 people an excerpt of what the under is with the live performers. And we didn't, it wasn't the ship, but, um, whoops. What we, what we had to do is we had to create a um, kind of stage managing tool so that some people are watching bird's eye view of these are live people being put in the headset, coming in as characters, and you'll see them as kind of black ghosts or time spirits. And we're watching uh, live, and we're giving notes to the uh, actors where they are on um, the timing of this 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 is a player and they're having a one-on-one -on -one encounter with this actor so we're watching you know all these actors doing their things at, at all different times and giving notes like okay timing cue is done move on to this or show him the crab again or which you know that's albert the crab and this other actress is standing by she's waiting for her cue off stage i don't ever forget a poem and she's giving a palm reading she's this zombie performer named helvetica perpetua um, so <laughs> that's actor accidentally hit the wrong button and they both appeared in the scene. So they have to kind of reconcile that in improv live. I come for a little quiet moment for myself. So let me take a look at your palm. And here is the stage. This is uh, one of the recorded acts, Wet Food. And these are other um, audience members. So this is a multiplayer game. So uh, in each room, up to 15 people can join at once. And there's a lot of, we created a lot of behaviors for emergent play. We purposely limited a, um, voice for logical reasons, but also for, to create expressive opportunities for the players to communicate with each other. Um, so there's different ways of snapping. There's different ways of holding hands and having haptic feedback, of engaging with objects in the space. Um, so these, they're a mix of recorded acts, but then at any moment, anywhere in the world, an actor, it's sort of, we, cr we, we realized we were creating this dystopian Uber for actors, where actors could join in into a headset and then be on shift and just interrupt these acts with this live. Okay, listen, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. This is a live game show that's happening for the audience. Yes, 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 I love the snacks. I eat them for breakfast. Thank you. Mm, yummy, folks. Yummy. So yummy. All right. And there's a, where's he gonna, uh, I think it's here. And this is assistant Tina the skeleton. The beach ball has it, folks. It's the beach ball. Give yourselves a hand. You all brought wonderful objects. Come here. All right. Tina, here, you can play with this. So right. actors have to not oh, only improv, know their script, but they also have to memorize all, right. all these numbers of like who did what switch. when so that, that they can recall game, that and work that into their favorite. act. Tina, let's bring it up. It's... Don't press the button, that's right. All right, so, oh, our glorious winner, listen. It's your job now to play. Don't press the button. The name of the game is the game of the game, folks. It's, it's, it's not complicated. So, Tina, let's get our timer started. All right. Will they press the button? Did you see the button? Look behind you. Did you see it? That's the button that you're trying not to press. Do you understand? All right, you can do anything else but press the button. Do you think they should press it, folks? What do we think? Snap if you think they should press the button. Okay, I'm, I'm hearing some snaps, Dave. The crowd wants it. Will you do it? Will you do it? 
Oh, oh, they're teasing us. Oh, what a tease, what a weasel. Oh, I like it, because I'm kind of a weasel myself. I get it. All right, go. Oh, you're circling the button. You're admiring how shiny and red it is. Oh, the, the crowd wants it, they're snapping. Oh, will they do it? Oh, the pain, the pain. Oh, I'm sorry. Those who press the button get the cage. <laughs> so, so if you don't press the button, you win a car, and you know, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so this project's still ongoing. It's gonna the full release is in about a few months from now. And thank you. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Uh, thank you so much, Smith. I have appropriate for interrupt, <laughs> featuring these interruptions. Uh, so we're going to have a brief Q&A, just about 15 minutes. So if you give us a moment, we're going to bring some chairs on stage and have a real informal discussion with the artists. Thanks. Hello, hello. Oh, cool. Hey. Uh, so, could we just get another round of applause for the artists and their excellent showcase? Because they'll be great. That was so awesome. So excited to see those things paired together as well. Um, so, my first question is super broad. If each of you could just talk a little bit to your trajectory as artists, uh, especially within this context of new media, how you came upon working with new media. Uh, and what your work has looked like since you came upon working with new media. Does anyone want to start? You, you can go first. Okay. <laughs> sure. uh, yeah, I can try it. That I feel like I could, I could go on about that for a long time, so I'm going to try <laughs> to be concise. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I am a programmer, I have a programming background, and um, I came here and did my MFA uh, starting in 2009. Um, and I came here thinking I was going to make work with um, work for screens that was very, uh, I don't know, sort of like like really simple and bad versions of what Samantha just was showing, <laughs> of like dynamic generative narrative things. And then uh, while I was here, I really didn't want to do that at all, and I ended up uh, getting much more interested in, in uh, physical performance and, um, and how to kind of represent structures, uh, control structures and power structures within digital environments uh, physically. So rather than like putting me into the, into the screen, I was trying to put the screen in, into me, where I sort of felt it already was. Um, in terms of a trajectory, uh, I feel like it's hard to say. I mean, this, the work started out really more as performance poetry uh, and only became, I only got interested in playing characters like a few years ago. And then uh, now, the stuff I'm working on right now, the really new stuff, because that wasn't really a new piece, the really new stuff has non-synthetic characters mixed with synthetic characters, and they fade back and forth. <laughs> so there's this like playing with the edges of of, uh, of different kinds of characters, and then playing myself. So I'm kind of interested in that in that I don't know space of of presenting the self but not the self. And 
So cool. blah, blah, blah. that's it. Cool. Um, I was originally from a background that was more traditional um, poetry and theater. And I came to Brown as a freshman. And I fell into somehow the cave. Um, and working with, you know, what this was now, it was at, called electronic writing at that time. And I was very interested because it allowed me to get kind of off the page in ways that I tie back into my interest in theater and, and the hybridity of work and this sort of element of liveness. Um, and that segued into an interest in like engaging conceptually with a language as a material. Um, and a lot of those interests kind of boiled over into my current work, which uh, previous projects than this are actually more uh, political interventions into current um, techn immersive technologies, such as uh, there was a project called Virtual Virtual Reality, which is a kind of satire comedy on the whole Silicon Valley, like VR take that I found myself operating in at the time. There's one um, that's called Tendar that I showed last year, which is an AR piece, but it uses um, emotion recognition to uh, kind of, uh, and like this fish to talk about some of the elements we were talking about, such as machine learning, you know, biometric data, and it's actually a very political project, but it's been um, billed as like a game and a kind of selfie tool that people have been using. Um, and then this one, which goes back to interest in live theater and wanting to try to push that element of liveness. Cool. Um, I grew up as a musician, and um, that brought me into the world of composition, which um, led me to theater and dance as a sound designer. And um, through that, I found myself in those positions as well as, as someone who was creating um, dance. And um, then in comes this desire to synthesize everything. So um, yeah, I, I have been working toward uh, creating pieces which involve um, every, every aspect of the stage uh, with the sound as being kind of the base of what I do. Um, my background is in poetry and filmmaking, or video to be specific. And uh, currently, our work as Drought Spa, I think, is trying to seek out performative formats that rely more on machinic sensing than human control or the sense of um, machine-human hybridity. And uh, so I'm interested in those sort of generative relationships because as I kind of hinted at in the, in the piece, um, the creative response kind of flows both ways and I really appreciate how that signal gets corrupted or illegible. Um, and um, some of my independent work, kind of like what you were saying, I fo focused a lot on um, yeah, biometrics and just sort of uh, different political concerns and just trying to tease that out within the realm of new media. Cool, thanks. Uh, something I found really fascinating about all your works, uh, and you spoke to this a little bit, Samantha, but you know, especially couched in this, this festival format of interrupt, I was wondering if all of you could speak to how you view your work as a kind of interruption or interrogation of existing formal structures, existing social structures, things of the sort. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, I guess our work kind of got interrupted. <laughs> but, <laughs> but generally speaking, um, I think honestly that very um, aleatoric element is endemic to the work itself, just thinking in the, the long view, and um, that may be considered a form of interruption mm -hmm. because we don't really always know what is going to happen because we're dealing with very sensitive technology. Um, so that, that's one way I'd couch that. Do you feel similarly? or? I mean, the other thing is, I, um, in, in, in the context of uh, academic um, symposium or, 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 or the like, um, we're interested in presenting that sort of content in a very abstract way. So that's, that's another way of interrupting for us. Yeah, we're fans of eligibility. <laughs> <laughs> Obfuscation. Yeah. Cool. 
Um, as artists, I, I should say that Tender Claws is with my partner, Danny Canazaro, of 12 years, and we're often working with these, um, sometimes different companies or clients that are working with the, what people are calling emergent technolo emerging technology, although we know it's been around and there's a historical basis. So our, our sort of artist role is um, creating interventions into that space as best we can, you know, both to kind of make um, the consumers of these games and, and cultural products think more about, you know, what the underlying process is that they're, they're engaging with. And like in this case, to try to create opportunities and avenues for maybe um, people in experimental theater or this way of uh, showcasing liveness that wouldn't necessarily have existed because of the rigid structures that some of the um, is systems operate in. And uh, I think for me, what's actually happened that I'm dealing with that's interesting is a year ago at Sundance, we showed uh, Tendar, which was that AR piece. And we, it kind of takes place in the shell company that's trying to use this kind of like friendly um, kind of AR like guppy that's like a Tamagotchi that eats your feelings that you're raising. And it's a kind of, a, a, there's a whole like complicated kind of um, emergent narrative system behind it. And it's recognizing objects in your world and it's telling the player, you know, what it's discovering about your world and objects and then about your emotions. And it's getting like more and more personal. And the idea is that the company is also using this to kind of gather data to know how, how, what moves people's hearts and minds for story. And after we showed it at Sundance, we had a meeting with, with somebody um, that uh, Danny was talking to the project. And then six months later, they come out with a startup creating AR, avatars, but the, the company we parodied became a real company. <laughs> and um, so that's something that often happens to us in, in our sphere that you know, we're intersecting with. <laughs> <laughs> it's a science fiction danger. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm just thinking about Tendar, but I guess for, for, the, for the stuff I'm writing, probably a lot of the, the satirical dimensions are really obvious. Um, I, I'm interested in, in kind of like, you know, the value systems that are, that are there uh, right under the surface of like corporate systems a lot and uh, trying to articulate those or like inhabit positions that I don't necessarily like um, and say things that I don't agree with. And uh, there's, a, there's a particular kind of chipper quality that I like uh, or like to not like uh, in synthetic speech aesthetics, but also just in the ways that language is used by, uh, by corporate entities, particularly other kinds of power structures. Uh, there's a glibness that, um, that I find really interesting to, to probe. Um, but uh, but in, in like writing this material, this just made me think, like Samantha, what you said made me think of this, like, I was playing with this, with different versions of this material, and there was a, a like the um, the bit I was talking about about um, you know like mining uh, people for for social scores. I mean that's like that's factual already uh, in 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 China, and, and it's true here too, really, uh, in different ways. And I I had a last summer I was I was looking for a um, for a new uh, paying gig. And uh, <laughs> and I had this phone meeting with this with this guy who was doing a startup uh, who had already start, started the startup, and we had this phone call and he described it to me and it was basically what I had just been writing about satirically, <laughs> which it was like to my, like a, a service that employer, employers could, could companies could hire to mine content online from that their employees posted, uh, but without their consent. Um, and to trawl it for things that could be uh, either considered to be a problem or surfaced as uh, natural content. And it was, it, all of his examples were so awful. And, and, I mean, he was, his example was like Taco Bell employees. <laughs> uh, and I was just like listening to him talk about this and I was just like, this is like, you can't satirize this because it's like already true. It's, it's, it's so pervasive. Um, anyway. Notion of natural content is really funny to me, yeah. and this idea that you guys can kind of like will things into existence post creation, which I guess is linked to another question: um, where where are you drawing inspiration from? Like, what are you looking at? I mean, you're talking about the things that you parody, but what other things, even on like a tiny scale, do you feel like is informing the work you're making right now? And this can include like 
other creative works you've been seeing recently, if you're really jazzed about stuff that's happening? Um, I think I'm mostly motivated by like anger and terror at the world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Some, some culture in there. Yeah. But mostly those. I think I'm um, motivated by juicy contradictions and um, teasing those out in ways which are interesting and provocative. Cool. I mean, we have a limited amount of time, so I want to open up to the audience if anyone has any questions for these artists specifically about these pieces or about their work in general. Um, I can't see that well, but does anyone have any questions? Yeah, John? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, th it thinks it's imminently fundable. <laughs> also, Alphabet also wrote for Alphabet. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, do you, should I? Uh, Ian was one of the people who wrote for that uh, project as well. Oh, for, yeah, for Tendar. Yeah, for Tendar. For the fish. <laughs> <laughs> In this case, the, the under isn't for alphabet. No, no, I, I Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wonder if they have okay. the too, too much liveness. Too much liveness. <laughs> Does anyone else have any other questions? <laughs> too much liveness. That's <laughs> skipping of this alphabet. Too live, too. <laughs> too dynamic. Come on, someone's got some. Do the artists have questions for each other? Yeah. Um, Ian, how long does it take you to practice the, the intonation? You're really, really good, so I was just wondering. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, I mean, it's, I, I've been doing it a long time, or versions of it, yeah. now a really long time. Like I started really when I was a grad student here, like almost 10 years ago. Um, and it's just evolved over time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's a whole range of them, so. I mean, it, yeah, I don't, even, I don't even know in a way. It's just gradually evolved, so there's not, like, but for a particular piece, I, it, takes, it takes a long time. I guess that's the short answer, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a lot of making funny noises at, in, in, in the shower, reading the Dr. Bronner's bottle or whatever. Um, it's practice. I guess maybe that's, I was gonna ask about what your showers were like. But no, you know, that's, that's, what that's, that's, that's a weird question. That's what, like, no, no, not at all. It's just you like. <laughs> it's it's stream, yeah. streaming content, yeah. <laughs> like streaming? Yeah. Yeah, did you have something? Yeah. I was in a show a few years ago with Susan Bennett, um, <laughs> who was the original source of the, oh of the voice of Siri, and, and we were on the same bill, and that, that was really fun for me. Uh, but... Did you know she went here, Anne? What? Did you know she went here to Brown? She did. Yeah, she went to Brown. Wow. Yeah, she was on like an a cappella group or something. Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> she and I have so much in common. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's, yeah, but I've, there are other people doing really interesting synthetic voice stuff that I've met. Like, I've, I've met some comedians who are doing things with, with synthetic voice. Like, there's this comedian, Tessa, um, oh God, what's her last name? Scara, in New York, who does some really great work. Has a totally different synthetic register than I do. Um, so I guess she's not a rival. No machine rival. It's mine, it's trademarked. <laughs> Nobody else can make this gesture. Um. <laughs> Good. I, I wanted to ask you about, about those ruptures in your performance, because I, I tend to really like, I mean, as you probably saw, like I put them in on purpose, but I, I like glitches in, in work. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how open you feel to those or how much they feel like they mess with what you intend to do or if, they're, if they, you feel like they just end up folding in 
if you just want to talk about the kind of rupture, maybe in the interrupt context. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll let you answer first. I mean, it's, it's interesting in the history of computer music, there, in computer music conferences, it's, th they've always been known for, you know, the crazy <laughs> noises mm -hmm. which um, occur because computers have been ill-equipped to make, do that kind of work. And um, of course, over time, um, computers have become a lot more powerful and it's, it's, it's interesting kind of with, with that background that it's, you know, it still happens, it still occurs all the time. Yeah. I'll do like the, the Miss America response. Like, <laughs> I try to embrace it, you know, because, uh, but it's, it's interesting, it provides, it opens up new avenues in the work, I think, because it allows me to like, I'm, I have to rely on my body now, or I have to do something else with the language or with my voice, you know, and treat this kind of vessel as an extension of the performance that we had prepared to be maybe more machinic or machine influenced. And so when that breaks down, like what sort of fills that vacuum or do you just sort of leave the vacuum? Do we have to always fill vacuums? So these are just kind of philosophical concerns that I think come up and they really assert themselves um, sometimes in inopportune ways, but it's, it's always interesting, especially folding that in for the next performance, like to see where they lead you, yeah. Yeah. it happens. Yeah, I do. I do tend to really love those moments, like when it, when it drops out completely, and you are just left with bodies in space that are making like physical sounds on the floor or something. There's something that, that like a I don't know. It's like peeking behind the curtain for a second, or it's, there's a right. Um, and it, it feels so disruptive, but the disruption kind of feels good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And breaking that interdependence momentarily is also can be very productive, mm -hmm. you know, especially given like the thematic content of, of what we were discussing. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. Well, with that, I think we will close out this event and move forward. Uh, there is a workshop happening, Thea, is that correct? Yes. What are the details? Hi everyone, thanks for coming to this panel. Just wanted to let you know there's a workshop happening in the Multimedia Lab with Sally Chen starting at four. No coding experience required. <laughs> oh, okay, no, it's starting at five, not four. So that's good, there's a bit of time now. And then we're gonna meet here again at six for the keynote talk with Jackie Wang, which I encourage everyone to come to. Thanks to our performers. Awesome. Thank, Thank you everyone you. for coming.